So as Taylor said, my name is Don Darling. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm an LICSW, which is a licensed independent clinical social worker. Uh, my business is Sunrise Therapy, and I'm currently located at Kearney Counseling Associates over by YRTC. I identify as a cisgender female, and I want to humbly come before you today with an understanding that I come with cisgender privilege. I have my own um, personal bias that I'm trying to constantly be very well aware of. I have white privilege, like this is where I'm coming to you from. I absolutely appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you today and for all of you being here today. What, what a great um, symposium this has been. Today I'm going to be speaking about supporting the transgender community from the perspective of an ally and a mental health provider. I also want to thank Patrick Arnold and all of UNK for having this event today. So in I graduated from UNO with my so master's in social work degree in 2014, and immediately after graduating, I started my own um, private practice doing mental health therapy at Kearney Counseling Associates. And later, late that year in 2014, I started working with transgender clients. And I was affirmative and I was accepting and willing to work with the trans population, but I um, didn't know everything. I still don't know everything. But as I started working with them, I realized that there was no mental health or medical health providers in the area that I could find that worked with this population. And um, so I set out to start changing that in our area. And I started working really hard at educating myself, gaining um, understanding and awareness and um, the ability to work with this population in um, an effective way. So that's where I come from. I want to point out my slides. My slides are all color coded and they have a symbol in the background. The colors are the colors of the transgender flag, which are pink, blue, pink, and white. And the symbol in the background is the transgender symbol. We have three learning objectives here today. The first one is to gain a clear understanding of the experiences and challenges faced by the transgender people. The next one is to clarify the role of the mental health provider in transgender affirmative, affirmative care. And third, to increase knowledge of how to be a supportive ally to the transgender community. So we're probably all familiar with these letters, LGBTQIA+. And um, if, if you all, if somebody doesn't know what any of these letters mean, this is what they all mean. There's other words that stand for uh, the letters, but this is the, um, basically what they all mean. I'm going to be using the letters LGBTQ today. And for this presentation, we're going to be focused on the T in LGBTQIA, and that's transgender. So how many people here know someone who identifies in the LGBTQ community? That's wonderful, there's so many hands. And who here knows someone who's transgender? Okay, fantastic. Um, I do wanna point out that if you're here and you're transgender today, there may be some things that I say that might be triggering for you. So just be aware that um, there is that possibility. So I wanna start with transgender and what that kind of means for us today. Transgender is an umbrella term that includes people whose gender identity and or their gender expression is different than their sex assigned at birth. So for example, people who fit under the transgender umbrella can include any of these that are here, um, a transgender man or woman, uh, gender queer, gender non-binary, two-spirit, any of these people. As I speak today, when I say transgender, I mean anybody who's under the transgender umbrella. Most of us have been socialized into a society that believes gender is binary, meaning that there's only two options, a boy or a girl. This is not accurate. 
Instead, gender identity exists on a continuum. To help us understand gender identity, we're gonna go through this graphic. So we start out with the top of the graphic, which is says sex or sex assigned at birth. A person's sex assigned at birth is based on a person's physical genital anatomy when they are born. Babies are generally assigned either male or female. Some people also are identified as intersex. This occurs when their sex is not easily assigned or when they have a mixed reproductive system. And then we move down to gender identity. Gender identity is a person's personal sense of their own gender. So I'll explain a couple of terms that you've heard thrown around here today. The first one is cis, which is C-I-S. Cis means on the same side of. So a cis person is a person whose sex is assigned at birth and gender identity are on the same side. And they're called cisgender. And then we have the term trans. And person who's trans means on the opposite side of. So if their sex is assigned at birth and gender identity are on different sides, they're considered transgender. Then we have a person's gender expression. This is how feminine or masculine a person presents. And they can present with their clothing, their hairstyle, the voice, how you walk or talk, the activities you participate in. All of those are our gender expression. And finally, we have sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is who a person is physically and or emo emotionally attracted to. And this is a unique experience regardless of one's gender identity. So you may have heard the argument that being transgender is a new fad, or that back when I was in school, no one was transgender, or this is just part of the liberal agenda. But I want to provide you with some historical context as a reminder that transgender people have been around throughout history. These are only a few examples. Born in 1886, Lucy Hicks Anderson was adamant that she was not a male, identifying as female before the term transgender ever existed. As a young child, Lucy's parents took her to doctors, and the parents were told to just let Lucy live as a young woman. Lucy's parents agreed, and she began wearing dresses to school and being known as Lucy. I really appreciate that doctor and those parents. Wow, weren't they before their time? Throughout the course of her lifetime, she married twice and was repeatedly fined and jailed by the government for alleged fraud, for impersonation, impersonation charges, and perjury on her marriage license. Because at the time, marriage was only between a man and a woman, and, Lucy, and they said that Lucy was not a woman. However, she was quoted with saying, I defy any doctor in the world to prove that I am not a woman, and I have lived, dressed, it, dressed and acted just what I am, a woman. Many people consider Lucy to be one of the earliest pioneers for marriage equality. Born in 1915, Lawrence Michael Dillon was the first transgender man ever to undergo a phalloplasty, which means the surgical construction of a penis. He also published a book in 1946 entitled Self, A Study of Endocrinology and Ethics, which many people consider to be the first book about transgender identity and gender transitioning. In this book, Dylan describes trans the transgender identification as innate and unaffected by psychotherapy and he advocated for the use of medical treatment using hormones and surgery as an alternative. Dylan himself went on to aid in the surgical transition of Roberta Cowell, which was Br Britain's first male to female transgender person to ever undergo sex reassignment surgery. Born in Houston in 1916, Little Axe was a gospel singer known for his tiny stature, stature and huge voice. Little Axe performed with several gospel groups, including the Southern Gospel Singers, the Five Trumpets, the Golden Echoes, the Spirit of Memphis Quartet, and most famously, the Five Blind Boys of Mississippi. 
Continuing to perform well into his 70s, it wasn't until an autopsy was performed following his death that it was revealed Little Axe was actually a trans man. Born in 1926, Christine Jorgensen is often cited as the first American woman to successfully undergo gender reassignment surgery. In reality, although hers was one of the earliest cases, she, her surgery followed on the heels of at least a few other people. She was, however, the first person be to become widely recognized as a transgender woman and was generally a good sport about giving interviews and responding gracefully to media interests. And finally, we have Marsha P. Johnson. She was the co-founder of STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, with her friend Sylvia Rivera. Marsha P. Johnson was American gay liberation activist and self-identified drag queen. Known as an outspoken advocate for gay rights, John jo Johnson was one of the prominent figures in the Stonewall Uprisings of 1969. These people are just a few examples, reminding us that trans people have been around throughout our country's history. All of these people experienced significant challenges because of their trans identity. So let's talk about some of the common ch challenges that trans people face today. In 2015, the National Center for Transgender Equality conducted the U.S. Transgender Survey. This was an anonymous online survey conducted both in English and in Spanish, and just over 27,000 transgender people responded. The findings revealed disturbing patterns of mistreatment and discrimination and startling disparities between transgender people and the U.S. population when it comes to the most basic elements of life. I'm going to highlight a few of those findings. The first one is harassment and discrimination. There's a long history of trans folks being characterized as mentally ill, social deviants, or sexual predators. This societal stigma causes many trans people to isolate in their homes out of a real fear of being harassed or discriminated against in public. As a matter of fact, many trans people refuse to use public restrooms due to their fear of being harassed and discriminated against. The next is violence and murder. Since 2015, the number of trans people killed by acquaintances, partners, and strangers has been between 25 and 30 people per year. That is over two people per month being killed in the United States every year just for being transgender. Suicide. 41% of transgender people have attempted suicide in their lifetimes. The previously mentioned minority stressors contribute to this elevated prevalence of suicide attempts among transgender people. Over 50% of those who experience harassment or bullying in school have a lifetime suicide attempt. 57% of those who experience family rejection have attempted suicide. 69% of those who've ever experienced homelessness have a suicide attempt, and 60% of those who report a doctor or a healthcare worker providing healthcare worker refusing to provide treatment to them have attempted suicide. This makes it blatantly clear that suicide attempts are generally not due to simply being transgender. Instead, they are due to society's rejection and discrimination of the transgender person. Next, we have poverty. At least 15% of trans people live in poverty, which means they make less than $10,000 per year. For transgender people of color, the rates are even higher, with 34% of blacks and 28% of Latinos living in extreme poverty. This causes one in five trans folks to resort to selling drugs 
or engaging in sex work for income. The next is inaccurate identity documents. 33% of people who have transitioned have not been able to update their identity documents um, to match their affirmed gender. So this includes their driver's license, social security card, um, passport, any of those kinds of documents. This can have an impact on every area of their lives, including accessing emergency housing or other public services, traveling, registering for school, and accessing many essential services in the community. Barriers to health care. Transgender people need access to trans-sensitive health care. Trans people often avoid going to the doctor due to fear of discrimination by their doctor or the doctor lacking knowledge about their health care needs. And finally, a lack of legal protection. About half of transgender people are uncomfortable turning to the police for help due to a fear of discrimination. Trans people are not legally protected by law in every state. Only 22 states have anti-discrimination policies that include sexual orientation and gender identity. Nebraska is not one of them. As a matter of fact, the only city in Nebraska that has any type of dis non-discrimination policy for sexual orientation and gender identity is the city of Omaha. These are all what we would call macro aggressions or societal aggressions towards the trans population. But trans people also often experience microaggressions on a daily basis. Can anyone tell us what a microaggression is? Super brave people. Microaggressions are defined Okay, microaggressions are defined as brief and commonplace verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or in unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative prejudicial slights and insults towards a marginalized group. So there's there are those little subtleties, and sometimes not so subtleties. Yeah. The first one is dead naming and misgendering. The name given to a person at birth is called their dead name after they've changed their name socially, whether or not they've changed it legally. Once a person has informed us of the name they're using, we just need to use it for them. In the same way as part of the transition process, trans people often change their pronouns to better fit who they are. It's incredibly offensive and hurtful to continue to use someone's dead name or wrong pronouns once they've informed us of how they would like to be identified. The next one is cis sexist or transphobic comments. Cis sexism is a belief that cisgender people are more superior or more normal than trans people. And transphobia is emotional disgust, fear, violence, anger, or discomfort felt or expressed toward a transgender person. Some examples of these types of comments include referring to a cisgender person as a normal person or a regular people, or verbally comparing a trans person to a cis person by saying something like, oh, I would have never known you were transgender. You look just like a real man or you'd pass so much better if you wore more makeup. Those are microaggressions. The next one is asking intrusive questions. So we should never ask anyone, including trans people, if they'd have any kind of surgery or what they have in their pants. We should also never ask trans people how they have sex. Like if we're not interested in answering those questions for ourselves, we really shouldn't be asking anyone else. And then the next one is making assumptions about a person's gender, gender journey, or transition goals. We are socialized to gender strangers by saying things like, yes ma'am, or excuse me sir, but instead we should work on identifying people in other ways 
by saying, calling people folks or y'all, or just simply leaving out a gendered response. Also, it's important to remember that every person's transition is different. We should never assume that just because we knew one trans person or because we read a book about a trans person that everyone's experience is going to go that exact same way. So let's let individuals be individuals. And then some of the biggest microaggressions include judgmental looks, whispers, and giggles in person. And then good old social media. Social media posts, memes, and comments. We should be very careful about those kinds of behaviors and proliferating that kind of attitude in person and on social media. It's important to realize that trans people deal with these types of microaggressions on a daily basis, and they can be very hurtful and very discouraging. Speaking of microaggressions, I'd like to take a moment to discuss something that happened right here in Kearney just last year. Riley and Keisha Wright were a happily married couple who were very active and loved in the LGBTQ community. Riley was an out trans man. They were married in 2015 and they were inseparable. Everybody knew them in the community and everybody loved this couple. Riley and Keisha were in a tragic car accident on February 5th, 2018, and they both lost their lives that day. It was originally reported by the Sheriff's Office and NTV News that two women had died in the crash. But several people immediately reached out to NTV News, informing them that one of the victims was actually a transgender man. And thankfully, the news made the appropriate corrections right away. When NTV reached out to the Buffalo County Sheriff's Office, they stated that they've never dealt with a transgender fatality like this before, and that they use legal documents like driver's licenses, dental records, or fingerprints to identify people. So this makes it blatantly clear that as long as our society identifies people by gender, misgendering is going to continue to happen. So this comic just is a good reminder that the transitioning process is as unique and individualized as each person, and it definitely takes a lot of time, energy, and determination. Oops. It's important to understand that every transgender person's transition is different. But these are some of the main areas that people must consider as they go through their transition process. This is not like a linear list or anything, it's just these are all things that people deal with. Um, the first one is an internal acceptance. So one of the first things that happens with a person is they kind of start having this sense that how they view themselves on the inside isn't the same as how society is identifying them on the outside and so they start beginning to have this uh, internal conflict and a lot of people will either start reaching out to friends or they'll do some Google searching and they'll come across this term of transgender and they'll look at the term and it will really resonate with them and they'll start identifying as transgender and this might bring them a great deal of relief but it might also come with some grief because there's a heaviness that comes with the fact, with this realization that you're trans and what that's gonna mean for the rest of your life. So they're dealing with those kinds of things. Um, they also have to deal with internalized transphobia and cissexism, as we all do. We are raised in a society that teaches us that certain beliefs and so they all have to um, deal with that also. 
And then as they're going through this process, they began potentially coming up with a new name for themselves and different pronouns. So they're beginning to kind of identify in a different way. That leads them into generally a social transition. So the social transition is a coming out process, and it's a process to come out to family, to friends, to coworkers, to people at school or other community groups. And it happens at different times with different people. I must point out that according to research conducted by TransActive, family acceptance predicts greater self-esteem, social support, and general health status. It also protects people against depression, substance abuse, and suicidal ideation and behaviors. So one of the most important things we can do for our family members or we can advocate to people when we're working with the trans population is to help that family accept their person. Next thing is mental health therapy. So many transgender people choose to attend therapy as a starting place to clarify their gender identity and or as a first step to moving forward from their social transition into a medical transition. We're going to talk more about mental health therapy in just a little bit. The next one is hormone therapy. So the guidelines have been set forth by the Endocrine Society on how we should be doing hormone therapy. Prior to puberty, kids don't need to do any type of hormone therapy. Their transition is solely a social transition. Once they start going into puberty, then we can consider putting them on to hormone blockers. Hormone blockers are going to halt the puberty process and kind of maybe bias some time for the child to um, clarify their gender a little more solidly. Um, during all of this time, we're look looking for our kids to be insistent, consistent, and persistent in their gender identity. And then, as they get into their later adolescence, maybe around 16-ish, depends on the doctor, and on into adulthood, they can begin hormone therapy. Um, hormone therapy for uh, our trans women can include estrogen and pro progesterone and sometimes testosterone blockers. And then for our trans men, it can include testosterone. Hormone therapy is highly effective in developing secondary sex characteristics such as facial hair, lowering the voice, and increasing muscle mass for our trans men, and then in de developing breast tissue, softening of the skin, and affecting fat distribution in our trans ladies. The next one is those legal documents. This is such a pain. But um, people need to change their legal documents in order to um, um, line up with their identity. So one of the first places people sometimes start is uh, legally changing their name. So a legal name change includes um, putting your name in the newspaper for four weeks saying that you want to change your name and then having a court hearing uh, where the judge will decide if he's going to grant you the name change. Um, there's a little bit of financial cost to it, uh, and so when it, within about a couple of months, you can get that name legally changed, and that will kind of open the doors for these other identity documents to be changed. So you can then go to the DMV and get your name changed on there and your gender marker. Um, you can go to Social Security Administration and change your Social Security card. You can go to your bank and change your bank accounts. You can go to your credit cards. You can go to your medical insurance. The, the list goes on and on. Wherever your legal name is, that's a process in itself to get that all changed. And then finally, we have gender confirmation surgery. So guidelines have been established by the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, or WPATH. There's lots of surgery options. There's not just one surgery. So there's lots of things to consider, and every individual must consider what surgeries they definitely want, what surgeries they definitely don't want, uh, what surgeries they can afford, what surgeries their insurance is going to cover. And so this is kind of all a process in itself also. 
Hopefully this information has helped you all gain a clearer understanding of the experiences and challenges faced by transgender people. Now we're going to move on to the second learning objective, which is to clarify the role of the mental health provider in transgender affirmative care. And these comics that I'm using are, are comics written by a trans comic writer. First, we're going to talk about gender dysphoria. This comic is a really good example of what some people experience. Historically, as I said, transgender people began their medical transition by seeing a mental health provider. Mental health providers use the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illness or Mental Disorders, to diagnose clients in order to inform, inform treatment and bill for bill insurance for services. The DSM-5 contains the diagno diagnosis of gender dysphoria. To meet criteria for gender dysphoria, one must have a marked incongruence between their gender identity and the sex assigned at birth for at least six months. The problem with this diagnosis even being in the DSM-5 is that it creates this stigma that being transgender is a mental illness, which it is not. It's a medical issue. Um, in addition, requiring trans people to begin with a mental health provider in order to begin their medical transition essentially causes the mental health provider to act as a gatekeeper, deciding who is or who is not a psychologically fit candidate for medical treatment. So we're trying to str stray away from that kind of treatment of care. On the other hand, gender dysphoria is real and it can be debilitating. Seeing a therapist to learn to manage the dysphoria can be highly beneficial. Some, some of the types of things that cause dysphoria are different body parts or even mirrors. So sometimes when a trans person is walking around doing life, they see themselves, they feel good and confident about themselves going around. They have this visual image of who they are. And they, they happen to go past a mirror and catch a glimpse of themselves in the mirror and have to take a second look and realize that who they see in the mirror isn't who they are. And it, it can cause a great amount of dysphoria. So those are the things we can work with our clients to manage. On a side note, the World Health Organization provides the International Classification of Diseases, or the ICD, for medical practitioners around the world to uniformly code all medical and mental health diagnoses. The current ICD-10 uses the diagnosis of transsexualism. But the new ICD-11, which is coming out in May and will be fully implemented by the year 2022, has a new, is going to remove the diagnosis of transsexualism and replace it with a new diagnosis called gender incongruence. It's also going to be moved from the mental disorder section to a section called conditions related to sexual health. Hopefully this will help reduce stigma and increase insurance companies' compliance with covering medical treatments. The ICD-11 working group believes that it is now appropriate to abandon the psychopathological model of transgender people based on the 1940s model of sexual deviance and to move toward a model that is more reflective of current scientific evidence and best practice, more responsive to the needs, experiences, and human rights of this vulnerable population, and more supportive of the provisions of accessible and high quality health care tr treatment. As I mentioned earlier, many transgender people begin their medical transition with a medical uh, mental health provider. So those of us who are mental health providers here today need to be ready to provide competent care. 
First, let's talk about a treatment model that has been found to be ineffective and even abusive. Reparative or conversion therapy is promoted by many religious groups. Reparative or conversion therapy is founded on the belief that an individual can change their sexual orientation or gender identity either through prayer or through other religious efforts. The research on these efforts has, have proven them to be ineffective and oftentimes traumatically abusive. In 2007, a task force of the American Psychological Association undertook a thorough review of the existing research of the efficacy of conversion therapy. Their report noted that there was very little evidence-based research on conversion therapy and that the result of scientifically valid research indicates that it is unlikely individuals will be able to reduce same-sex attractions or increase other sex sexual attractions through conversion therapy. Beyond studies focused solely on conversion therapy, broader research clearly demonstrates the significant harm that societal prejudice and family rejection has on LGBTQ people, especially youth. Furthermore, there is scientific anecdotal evidence of harm to LGBTQ people resulting from attempts to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. Based on this body of evidence, every major medical and mental health organization in the United States has issued a statement condemning the use of conversion therapy. In short, there's clear evidence that conversion therapy does not work and pretty significant evidence that it is also quite harmful to LGBTQ people. Nebraska's current status on conversion therapy is that it is legal to provide con conversion therapy in our state. Has anyone heard of LB-167? Somebody want to tell us what it is? It says, I know. Yes, Legislative Bill 167, entitled Ban Conversion Therapy, was introduced by Megan Hunt in January of this year. This bill would make the use of conversion therapy as a counseling option in Nebraska illegal. A hearing was held on LB 167 in February, and it was a very controversial debate. No decision has yet been made on the bill. It, it hasn't made it out of committee yet. Um, I would highly recommend that you reach out to the judicial committee of our state, send them letters, make phone calls, and let them know that you want this bill to move forward to the legislative floor. There's ample evidence that societal prejudice causes significant medical, psychological, and other harms to the LGBTQ people. For example, research on this issue of family acceptance of LGBTQ youth conducted at San Francisco State University found that compared with LGBTQ young people who were not rejected or only slightly rejected by their parents and caregivers for being gay or transgender, highly rejected LGBTQ young people were eight times as likely to have attempted suicide, six times as likely to report high levels of depression, three times as likely to use illegal drugs, and three times as likely to be at high risk for HIV and STDs. It's clear that conversion therapy or rejecting a person for their gender identity or sexual orientation is not beneficial to them or successful in changing how they identify. Mental health clinicians must provide quality, effective care to our clients. I'm a member in good standing of WPATH. WPATH is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. 
and it promotes the highest standards of health care for transsexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming people through the development of their standards of care. The standards of care are based on the best available science and on an expert professional consensus. The overall goal of, goal of the standards of care is to provide clinical guidance for health professionals to assist transgender and gender nonconforming people with safe and effective pathways to achieving lasting personal comfort with their gendered selves in order to maximize their overall health, psychological well-being, and self-fulfillment. The standards of care include guidelines for providing primary medical care, gynecologic and neurologic care, reproductive options, voice and communication training, mental health services, and hormone and surgical treatments. While this is primarily a doctor, uh, this is primarily a document for healthcare professionals, the standards of care may also be used by individuals, families, and social institutions to understand how they can assist with promoting optimal health for members of this diverse population. You can find the standards of care online. The American Psychological Association has also created a list of guidelines for working with the LGBTQ population. The guidelines are intended to complement the treatment guidelines set forth by WPATH and includes an expectation that mental health clinicians will be affirmative and accepting of all gender identities. The guidelines include having competency in the following areas a foundational knowledge and awareness of the LGBTQ experiences, an understanding of stigma, discrimination, and barriers to care, competency in lifespan development, competency in assessment, therapy, and interventions, and an inclusive research, education, and training. And for all my fellow social workers out there, the National Association of Social Workers, or NASW, which is the largest social worker organization in the world, has developed a code of ethics that all social workers should follow. The code of ethics actually addresses non-discrimination of LGBTQ people throughout the document. In addition, NASW has a five-page written policy on transgender and gender nonconforming issues. Essentially, it says that social workers should provide a non-judgmental and affirming attitude toward the gender diverse population and provide maximum support and services to those whose gender departs from the expected norm. WPATH lists recommended minimum competencies for mental health professionals who work with transgender people. The first is having a master's degree in a clinical behavioral science field. The next is competency in using the DSM-5 and or the ICD for diagnostic purposes. Next is the ability to recognize and diagnose coexisting mental health concerns and distinguish them from gender dysphoria. The next is documented supervised training and competency in psychotherapy or counseling, being knowledgeable about gender nonconforming identities and expressions, and the assessment and treatment of gender dysphoria, and finally, obtaining continuing education in the assessment and treatment of gender identities and gender dysphoria. I would highly recommend that if you are working with trans clients that you get um, specific supervision from someone who is, has been doing this a lot longer than you um, with working with trans folks. I know I do a supervision on a monthly basis with Arlene Lev, who's out of New York. She's been, she's written books, she's on the WPATH Board of Directors, and uh, she's been working with trans people for over 30 years. She has a wealth of knowledge that I really appreciate um, being able to glean from. 
So let's talk a minute about trans-affirming clinical practice. According to a qualitative research study conducted with transgender people living in rural areas and published in Transgender Health in 2018, and according to the Planned Parenthood Manual on Transgender Healthcare, there are a few major things healthcare providers should be doing in order to be considered safe and affirming for the transgender population. So the first one is having affirmative or affirming front office staff. Research shows that the attitudes and reactions of our front office staff as the first point of contact with a provider's office can make or break your reputation as a safe place for trans patients or clients to go for care. It's vitally important that you work with your front office staff to be affirmative to every client that calls on the phone or walks through the door. The second point of contact is our intake paperwork. We've been mentioning that a little bit throughout the day. We need to have inclusive intake paperwork. Our paperwork should in include boxes for the client's legal name and their preferred name. Um, we should have a box for their sex assigned at birth and their gender identity. And I also like to have a box for pronouns um, so that when our client fills out their paperwork and turns it into the front office staff, that front office staff knows exactly how to identify the person and we'll have that information also. Of course, it's gonna be an ongoing conversation in the therapy office, but this is a really good starting point to know how to identify our person correctly. The next point of conflict contact is potentially the bathroom. So the bathroom issue is really important. It, it's a little disheartening for our clients to come and have a really great experience with our front office staff and, and be like, wow, this paperwork is really infir affirming to me, and then have to choose. Am I going to go in the women's or the men's? So if there's any possible way that we can make a bathroom um, gender neutral, then we need to make that change. And then when we go into our therapy office, we need to take a non-pathologizing approach. We must reject the gender binary and instead validate our client's gender identity and create an open atmosphere for the client to explore and clarify their gender identity. Sometimes when they come to us, they're not sure how, they're, I, how they want to identify. They need to be able to talk to a safe person to figure this stuff out. That's us. That's our job. Always, when, they, when our client has given us their name and pronouns, let's just always use it, even when they're not around. The next one is to increase our self-awareness of internal bias and then commit to developing our skills. For example, uh, <clears throat> I have this really bad habit of saying you guys um, for everyone. And it's kind of a Midwestern thing, maybe. I don't know. Maybe everybody says it everywhere. But I promise you, calling our trans women you guys can be really hurtful and really discriminatory. So I'm working on breaking that habit and being much more self-aware about how I'm identifying people. And so we just need to constantly be working on um, what am I portraying to the world and how can I be more inclusive. And then the last one is to advocate for trans equality. I really appreciated this morning when they said that we can't just sit in our offices and like hope people come to us. But we need to be in, in the community, part of the community, advocating for this community. Um, we need to advocate for equality for transgender people with other professionals and in our society. So we should be educating our colleagues, all of our colleagues that aren't here today. Every chance we get, we should help educate them um, we should be attending marches when we can, or being part of the groups in the community. We should be writing letters or making phone calls to politicians to affect change in Nebraska.
I, mu I must point out here that every trans client that comes into our office is not always there to work on gender stuff, right? So it's really important for us to collaboratively, collaboratively, I can't say words, to work together with our clients in order to um, figure out what their goals are and then to work towards those goals. So we understand that there's an intersectionality somewhere between whatever their goals are and them identifying in as a transgender person. And so we can be mindful of that. But if being if they're not there about being transgender, then let's not make every therapy session about them being transgender. If they're there for trans issues, on the other hand, WPATH lists the following therapeutic tasks that clinicians working with trans clients should be willing and able to perform. So let's go through those. Again, the first one is being able to assess gender dysphoria. Um, so we talk with our clients about how they experience gender dysphoria, kind of talk about how significantly it affects their lives and how we can, man how we can manage that in their daily lives. The next is to be able to help the client process their gender identity and expression and work on the coming out process. So it's super scary to come out. And uh, so it's important for us to be able to um, be there with them and alongside of them, not pulling them along saying, you have to do this now, and not saying, well, don't ever do it, but just kind of work together with them to get them through that process. And then the next one is being knowledgeable of and helping the client process their medical treatment options. We mentioned those transitioning options before. Let's talk together about that in the therapy office and figure out what's gonna work for you and what the timing looks like for you. The next one is being able to provide referral letters. So WPATH has a really nice, beautiful list of how to provide their uh, referral letters. Um, the medical providers that I work with in the area generally still appreciate getting a referral letter. They like the letter because it gives them a background history of the client's gender journey. It um, notifies them of the client's name and pronouns. And uh, it can also list like if there's any other mental health issues that they need to be aware of, then we can kind of put that in there. Um, that's what people in this area are appreciating. Now, generally we're moving away from having to provide therapy letters for hormone therapy um, and we're going towards a model of informed consent, but not all the practitioners are quite there yet in this area, and so we work with that. We still have to provide referral letters for surgery. And then the last one is work with family members as needed. So I think about this one a lot. I work a lot with families when it comes to our adolescents. So obviously, kids and teenagers have parents who are in charge of them. And a lot of times those kids or teenagers will come in my office and I'll be the first person that they come out to because they know that I'm a safe person to talk to about it. And then so we work together on how we're gonna tell the parents. And then once the parents are informed, uh, we I, I really appreciate being able to work with the parents to um, process their own maybe grief or um, anger or whatever feelings they're having about the situation. Maybe they didn't see this coming and so they maybe have doubt and fear. So I can work together with them on that instead of the kid getting the brunt of all of that. And then I can help lead them into a process of being super supportive of their child. We also work with family members, maybe spouses or significant others or other people in relationships that um, need a little extra help in being able to process through what their person's identity is. So far, we've covered the first two learning objectives. 
to gain a clear understanding of the experiences and challenges faced by transgender people and to clarify the role of the mental health provider in transgender affirmative care. So now we're going to move on to the final learning objective, which is to increase knowledge of how to be a supportive ally of the transgender community. This is what good allies do for our trans friends. So how to be a good ally. The first, some of these we've touched on already, but it doesn't hurt to touch on them again. The first one is to be respectful and inclusive. We can't assume that we know anyone's gender identity or sexual orientation. In every setting, it's good practice to take the approach that there's probably a transgender person in the room, and so we should always be validating of gender identities in every situation. If you're open and accepting, you're open and accepting. It's not an issue. The next one is using a person's correct name and pronouns. We should always be using the name and pronouns that a person is using for themselves. If you're unsure of what a person's pronouns are, first we should just listen and see if they identify themselves or if someone else identifies them, and then go from there. If you must ask which pronoun a person uses, you can start with your own. You can say something like, hi, I'm Dawn and my pronouns are she and her. What about you? Right? Um, and then when they tell you, then just use that. It's pretty simple. <laughs> Um, if you accidentally use a person's wrong pronouns, I mean, we're human, we do these things. Apologize quickly and sincerely, and then move on. The bigger deal that we make about it, the more uncomfortable it becomes for everyone. So just simple and easy and keep going. And then we should never ask what a person's real name is. So this is the same thing as asking what their dead name is and it's highly trigger triggering and hurtful. Knowing a person's dead name is not necessarily, not necessary or important, and it's actually none of our business. The next one is never out anyone. So we should never out a person without their express permission. This is not a thing that can be a, a done and then apologized for later and moved on from. Matt Cayley's Transifesto lays it out clearly. If you see a person on the street that you know to be trans, it's a private matter and not appropriate to tell your friends that the person is trans. It's also not appropriate to mention anything that would out a trans person if you're with, with that person in a public setting. The act of outing a trans person means potentially endangering their job, their families, and their bodies. So even if you're sure that everybody's going to be okay with it, it's no big deal, just don't do that. Um, it's not a mistake we can fix. So just make sure you check with your person to see how they want you to identify. Like I ask my, a lot of times my clients in the therapy office were trying out pronouns or trying out a name in the office, but they're not out in public. So we have to ask, like, okay, we're identifying this way here. What if I see you? out on the street or in this other setting at a protest or rally or whatever we're doing, how do you want me to identify you there? So it's important to make those distinctions, talk about that in the office. And then the next one is understand that every person's transition is different. A transgender identity is not dependent on any medical procedures or how their gender is expressed outwardly. So we just must Except that if someone tells you that tells you that they're transgender, we just have to believe them and use their name and pronouns. Be an advocate and activist. We must challenge anti-transgender marks, remarks, and jokes in public spaces. We must support gender-neutral public restrooms. We must help make our workplace or group trans-inclusive. At meetings and in events. 
we should set an inclusive tone and refuse to accept transphobic comments. There have been, there have been some great ideas presented here today about how to increase trans inclusivity. And finally, know your limits and keep learning. The best way to be an ally is to listen with an open mind to transgender people themselves. Talk to the trans people in your community, make friends with them, get to know them, find out about their lives. Being trans is only a part of a person. There's a whole rest of the person. So like get to know the whole of them and, and see how fantastic these people really are. Um, we can also check out books and films, watch YouTube videos, we can, watch, we can read trans blogs, any of those things can help us understand the trans experience a little better. Don't be afraid to admit when you don't know something. It's better to admit that you don't know something than to make assumptions or say something that's incorrect or really hurtful. Then seek out appropriate resources that will help you learn more. So, I told you at the beginning that I started my private practice in 2014. And at that time, I reached out to the community. I sent a bunch of letters to all the me medical providers in the area to try to identify some that would be trans affirmative and um, competent. And I, I wasn't really able to find anybody. And so we've been doing some work and my trans friends have been sharing information with me about their experiences with medical providers. And so since 2014, we've been able to compile a list of resources in the area uh, for, that are safe for our trans community to go to. So before that time, they were all driving to Omaha or Lincoln to get their medical and mental health care needs met. And that's, I mean, we talked about all the challenges for trans people and poverty and all of these things like play into that, making that a really difficult thing for them to do. So uh, we've created this resource list um, of trans affirming providers that I give out to my clients and I'm always looking to add to it. So I'm going to pass around a forum and if you know of any providers or businesses that are trans affirming, please add them to this list. I don't know what I did. So at this point, I've been able to identify uh, medical and mental health providers in North Platte, Holdridge, Kearney, Grand Island, and Hastings that are trans affirmative and can provide for their medical and mental health care needs. That's exciting. Yay! Okay, the next thing is PFLAG. So PFLAG is the United States' largest organization for the LGBTQ community and its allies. We have a local PFLAG chapter that meets on the third Thursday of every month. Um, there's also a Grand Island chapter and a Hastings chapter. We also have support groups that are not PFLAG affiliated in Ogallala and in Scotts Bluff. So we're getting there. Give us some time. We're going. The next one is Chameleons. Um, we started the Chameleons Transgender Support Group. Probably, I think it was 2015 that we started the group. And it's a private transgender support group that meets monthly. And we have a secret Facebook group page. And so um, the only way to get in that group is to be invited to join the group by somebody else who's in the group already. So this helps keep the group feel, feeling really safe and protected. Then the Queer Straight Alliance meets at UNK in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion in the Student Union. The Gender and Sexuality Alliance meets at Kearney High School. And I organize two national events per year for our area. So the first one is the Transgender Day of Visibility that just occurred on March 31st this year. We had it at the um, Kearney Public Library. My awesome, cool trans friends were on a panel and they were willing to share their experiences with the community. We had 25 people in attendance and it was super exciting. And then the other one we do is the um, the um, 
Transgender Day of Remembrance that's held on November 20th of each year, year and that is just um, to remember those who we've, we've lost during that year. And then here, this is the first ever LGBTQ conference held in Kearney, but I believe that there's going to be more to come, and I'm excited to see what's going to happen next. So this concludes my presentation, and I guess we might have a couple minutes if there's any questions, and then we'll go from there. I will absolutely share that with anyone that wants it. I didn't bring a copy of it today, but I have a table out there that has the free buttons and stickers, and my business cards are out there. So if you want to email me, I will absolutely send you the list. Oh, there's a question way back there. Oh. What would be a reason that you would not write the referral letter for surgery? I think there is uh, surgery uh, requires a lev lev level of stability. Um, surgery, both mental health wise and physical health wise. And so I think that um, those things would have to be considered in order to uh, do the letter for surgery. So if a person is having some significant issues dealing with other mental health issues, such as PTSD or um, depression, and we've been working through it, uh, well, actually what I would do is talk with the client about how we need to work on some of those things and get to a more stable place emotionally before we're ready for something like surgery. And so we would work together for something like that. Run, Patrick, run. Hello? <laughs> um, I was gonna ask, I run a few like youth groups uh, with kids from like 6th through like 12th grade and I was gonna ask how do I keep my um, trans youth safe from middle school kids and their jokes and stuff um, I guess who's that kind of do you understand my question absolutely um, kids can be mean yeah especially middle schoolers they're horrible uh, I think it's education and training, um, creating an atmosphere that those kinds of things are not allowed or accepted. And so uh, obviously we're not gonna be like, you're terrible, stop it. But we can, we can stop them in their tracks and say, oh, okay, hang on, wait a minute. That, that can be really hurtful for some people. So let's talk about um, some language that can be more open and accepting. Here's why we don't make those jabby jokes because um, you might think they're just jokes for fun or because everybody says stuff like that at school, but here's why that's, that can be really hurtful for people. And so educating them on um, kind of creating a new social norm or that stuff is just not okay. Yeah, I would, I would kind of head in that direction. Hi, Don. Hi. Um, I just, I have a comment, I don't have a question, but um, I just, I wanted to, you know, say that you've done something amazing for this community, and I remember when I first moved here, and I think it was really soon when you first got here, when we first met at that meeting at your office, and, um, you know, to look at where we're both at now, like, you've done amazing things here, and I'm so happy to see this, even out as far as Scott's Bluff, that's fantastic. Um, me and my coworker here, we, we work for uh, Department of Corrections, and we are, you know, very passionate about this as well as both part of LGBT, and we are trying to make a difference in our prisons because it's not something 
that's ever talked about in prison, especially male prisons. Um, so it was a great, great slideshow, and I really appreciate all you've done. Thank you so much. And yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Boy, the prison system and the, um, the whole police system and probably the military system kind of have this persona that, that we don't talk about these kinds of things and um, we have to be really tough. And some of the starting points of affecting change, I think, is those personal relationships with people and just sharing with them, like, here's some experiences that I've had and here's what I know, and let's, let's open a conversation about it and see where we can head with this to be more inclusive. And I really appreciate that you work with that genre of people. <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and then we'll have a more informal roundtable at 3.30 with some of the presenters in the keynote if you want to ask more spicy questions spicy. then. <laughs> this is a comment as well um, about reparative therapy. They might be in the middle of a rebranding kind of thing to call themselves reintegrative therapy. Um, because if you go to the web, if you look up reparative therapy, it'll go to the old website named after that guy who came up with it. I can't remember his name. Um, he's dead now, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> so you go to the website and it has like the stuff that you would normally see. You don't have to be gay and uh, you can you can choose to not be gay and da da da. And then a window pops up and it says, we have a new website. Do you want to go to the new website? And you click on it and it goes to a completely different thing. There's no mention of gay or uh, trans at all. So um, and it's called reintegrative therapy and it's couched in a bunch of like um uh s psychology terms and stuff and it's trying to rebrand itself and it has a video where like this skeptic uh <laughs> did a documentary about us and and look at his reaction now the answer will shock you uh so um not only is it like it doesn't work, but it's like this is a thing that hucksters and snake oil salesmen do. So um, it's it's basically the rebranding to uh, bilk homophobic parents out of their money. So um, that's all it is. <laughs> yep. Thank you. I, I will have to look into that for sure. Like Don said, please continue to write your legislatures and representatives yes. for posing version therapy practices in Nebraska. Please join us at 3.30 in that room for a policy roundtable and join me in thanking Don Darling again. <laughs>